D now 2019. Y'all ready to finish up? Yeah? Man, uh, it's been a fun weekend, but it has flown by. So, hey, if you guys would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Everybody in the room, we're going to be there this morning starting out uh, reading a text of Scripture together that's going to kind of drive uh, where we're going for this morning. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to start off in verse 4. So if you guys got it, would you please stand in honor of God's Word as we read together here and then also across all of our other campuses. So here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4, says, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your love that you have displayed to us, that you've given to us, that you've offered us to accept. And so, Jesus, we want to reciprocate that love to the world, so help us to see how to do that, Father. To draw people to you, Father, to, to see you work, to see you move, Father, to share your name and your love with others so that you, God, can then turn hearts towards you. So, Jesus, use us in a mighty way. God, teach us even now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. You guys can have a seat. Well, we are here to finish up what we have been talking about all weekend, and that is the one word that we've been talking about, and that is stand. And so this morning, the title of the message is The Priority of Love. And so all weekend long, we've been looking at the life of Daniel and how Daniel lived in a culture that was averse to the culture that we live in today. And so you, you probably would, you can see, like you look around our world, you turn on the news, you go to school, you go to work, you talk to some friends. Like you'll see, we live in a world that if you're a Christian, there's a tension that you've got to figure out how to manage. And that tension that you've got to figure out how to manage is how do I be in the world but not of the world? How do I influence the world and not be influenced by the world? And sometimes as Christians, I think we kind of approach it in one or two ways. One is I think uh, we know the truth, but for some reason the truth, for, like it makes us think that because we know it, we've got to be mean with the truth. We've, you know, we've, we've got to go out, we've got to, we've got to point fingers. You know, we've got to, we've got to push people down. We, you know, it's just this attitude that says, I'm right, and even though you may be right, the way that you're handling it, you're not helpful. And so we've got one group of people in the church that, like, that's how they, that's how they handle and they manage this tension, is they just come around with the truth and they just, they're just, well, I'm right, I'm going to, you're just going to deal with it. And then you've got another group of people in the church, the thing that they do is they kind of go the opposite side of the coin, and they think that because in the name of love and grace that we've got to maybe change a little bit of the truth, or try to at least, we can't really change what God's truth is, but we bend it and we shape it and fashion it in such a way that it becomes palatable to the people around us because we're, we don't want to offend them. We don't want to tell them they're wrong. We don't want to say, well, you know what, like you, you know, that just kind of goes against the standard of truth that God has said. And so... Uh, in the name of love, what we do is we, we lie. And we don't tell the truth about what God's word really says. And so you've got two sides of the coin. In fact, some of the people on the grace side, uh, they, they think that like they're more loving than God is. And, and that's, that's the most preposterous idea. That, like, you could be more loving than God is. God, God doesn't just have love. God is love. And so we serve a God who is love, we serve a God who is truth, we serve a God that embodied that in the person of Jesus Christ, and so we get to see that lived out through Jesus. And so all weekend we've been talking about this idea that you don't have to choose both. That you, you, don't, you don't have to choose, well I'm going to be mean with the truth, and you definitely don't have to choose, I'm going to bend the truth of the gospel in order that the people will accept it. That there is common ground in the middle, and all weekend, that's where we've met this guy named Daniel. Where we see a guy, Daniel, that not only lived in a culture that was different than his, but he thrived in a culture, that he influenced the culture. He wasn't just the, in, he wasn't influenced he was the influencer. We talked Friday night with our students about, are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Thermostat sets the temperature of the room and the culture around it, or are you a thermometer reactive in a way where you're living to the culture and you're shifted by the winds every time it changes? And so Daniel was, was a thermostat. He was someone that set the culture around him. And so to start off finishing our conversation, I just want to share a verse with you. It comes out of Galatians. In Galatians 5, verse 6, it says, For in Christ Jesus... There's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. 
Paul was writing to a group of people at the church of Galatia who were having a problem reverting back to the old laws as the way that faith, I'm sorry, as the way that they said that you were made righteous. See, the, the, the old law that God, give, that God had given to the people that he was using to set them apart from the world that they lived in, he gave that to them, and then eventually people started adding some more to it, and so there was this long list of rules, not only the law, but all these codes that they had to follow. And then when Jesus showed up on the scene, Jesus became the fulfillment of the law. Jesus came and took what we couldn't do, because we can't keep the law, and then he did what we couldn't do, died on the cross, and in that great exchange, he took our sin on him and then offers us his righteousness. And so Paul was having an issue with the church at Galatia because they were trying to express their faith by keeping the law. And Paul's like, no, 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 don't, 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 get, it, don't get it twisted. Like the way that faith expresses itself is now through love. In fact, Jesus bottom lined it for us in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus replied to somebody who answered him, what is the greatest command? He said this, he said, love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then there's a second one. It's just like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two things. So it's not enough just for us to have faith. But Jesus is calling us to a faith that expresses itself in love. And let's be honest, um, the church hasn't always gotten this right. One of the things we talked about Friday night as well in our message that we started out with, uh, remember students, I showed you a, a picture of my grandparents, and you're like, wow, this is awkward, why is he showing a picture of his grandparents? But there was a point. And the point was that in my grandparents' day, when they were growing up, so church was like a social standard. You kind of, you, you did it. There, there was all, in some places there existed this pressure that you went to church. It was accepted that that's who you were, yeah, that's what you did, that's what everybody else did. But then my parents' generation, what began to happen in that generation, it began to shift from being the social standard to people started saying, well, like, that's your standard, but, like, we got our standard over here. So, like, if you'll just live and let live, we'll just deal with these two competing truths. And so then we get to our generation today, and what you see in our generation is people no longer, like, even want to have a conversation about truth. Today, you, you look at society, and society thinks Christians are just an annoying and unnecessary part. And the reason that I think we've become annoying and unnecessary part of society is because we haven't done what Matthew 22 says. That we haven't loved God first, but then also loved others as ourself. And so I think culture has, um, I think they have some grounds to stand on when they look at the church that is supposed to be a group of people who love, but yet they don't find that. Because here's the deal, we, we, can we can antagonize, we cannot antagonize an influence at the same time. We can't be antagonistic in our approach, we can't be antagonistic in the people that we live with and influence, and influence those people at the same time. And here's the deal, Jesus has called us to influence culture. While the church is still here, that's our job. What are we influencing culture with? The gospel. And so if our message is one of mercy and grace and love and redemption and restoration, but we come at the world with, with things that are completely opposite of that, then people won't listen. And so this weekend we've been talking about that there's a way where you can live in, in the middle. Not in the middle of like truth, but what I'm saying is like there's, a, there's an approach that you can take where you are holding high God's truth, but also you are being overwhelming with his grace to the people around you. And, and Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand this. And, and in John chapter 13, he said, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if, and stop right there for a second, let's fill in the blank. Right now in the culture that we live in, in, in our American church culture, um, it, like what would most people probably fill in the blank with? Like most of us would probably fill in the blank. They will know you are Christians if you go to church. They'll know you are Christians if you have the t-shirt. They will know you are Christians if you're generally a good person. They will know you're Christians if you give of some of your time, of some of your money. They'll know you are Christians if you hang out with other Christians. Like there's a lot of things that other people would fill in the blank with and people would use to identify themselves as Christians. But what Jesus said is that they will know that you are Christians if you love one.
one another. What's interesting about this is that Jesus is offering, Jesus is offering permission to the world for them to judge us. Very often do we, very often in the church, I think, we look at the world and we start judging. Hell, 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 sin, 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 sinner, sinner, sinner. You know, like we're, we're quick to do that. But Jesus in this is offering permission to the world to look at us and determine, do you follow Jesus? Because if you do, you will love one another. If you do, you will love one another. Now, I know that there's a lot of us in the room that when we hear this, when we hear these, these verses, when we hear this message, we immediately begin to check out. Because if, you grown, if you've grown up in church, you know this answer. You know this. But what's interesting is like some of, the, some of us that come to church every time and we hear this, uh, like we, you know, we're like, you know, yeah, I heard that before, I get it. Yeah, let, well, let's move on to something deep. Let, 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 let's get deep with it. I, I need to go a little deeper. And, you know, and like we can go deep here. We, we, can, we can talk about all, all the deep doctrinal and theological issues, and those are important, and, and, and those are good. Yes, they, they're great. But here's the deal. What I have learned is that a lot of times, like when people mean deep, they mean confusing. Like they want to walk out of here spending time talking about the stuff that they talked about without going and live out the stuff that they talked about. And so if you want deep, here's deep, love your neighbor. Pray for those who persecute you. Walk across the cubicle and serve the guy or the lady that doesn't like you. What's interesting in the New Testament is that you find so many times that Paul is, when he's writing one of the letters in the New Testament, he's writing to a group of people that they have already been told the elemental doctrines of faith, but yet they're still not doing them. In fact, in Hebrews, you see that there's this, there's, there, in Hebrews chapter 6, there's this admonition given that like, look, you want to move on to deep spiritual things, but like you're still chewing, like you're still on milk. Like, you're, you're not ready for the heavy stuff. So like, let, let, let's, let's, let's talk about that. And so to, to kind of keep moving on, 1 Corinthians 14, it says, follow the way of love. Follow the way of love. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 4 and in a, in a 14, in a different version of Scripture, it says, let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. Like if tomorrow you started out the morning and you said, you know what, love will be my highest goal starting out today. Man, that'd be amazing. And, and here's why this is important. Because without love, all we say is ineffective. Without love, all that we say is ineffective. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, we read it earlier in verse 2. It says, if I have the gift, I'm sorry, in verse 1. It says, if I can speak in tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So without love, all we say is ineffective. My words don't matter if they don't have love alongside of them. And so I, I want to step on a soapbox just for a second. I don't know what a soapbox is, right? Like one of the things that I've noticed about our society is that it is a terribly opinionated and toxic society. Like you can't say anything, whether it's news, social media, school, work, whatever environment it is you hang out in, whatever environment you observe, you can't say anything without somebody on the other side of the line saying, uh-uh, so opinionated. I mean, we see this played out in news and politics and especially social media where all of us get a voice. I mean, we'll, we'll jump on social media in a heartbeat and we'll start talking about the other side. Whoever is on the other side. Like, we'll jump on social media and, and man, we'll do this thing, drives me nuts. We'll, we'll go, hey, I'm going to go on a rant. I don't know if you about, you know, like, every time I see that, like, I'm going to go on a rant. Do you know what a rant is? Rude, annoying, negative talk. That's what a rant is. And so when you see, like, people who are Christians get on social media and they start ranting, whatever it is they're ranting about, all they're doing is just talking rudely, annoyingly, and negatively about something that they don't like. And people who are not Christians see that and they go, I thought you were about love. And so without love, all we say is ineffective. In fact, in, in Ephesians, it's a great verse of Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, 
There we go. Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. How you use your mouth and the words that come out lead you to maturity in Christ. A few verses later in verse 29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. You know what my mama told me when I was little? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Can't tell you how many times I heard that. Must have meant I said a lot of mean things. But we got a lot of people who are acting like children on social media because they can't keep their mouth shut and they're ruining their opportunity to speak truth in the lives of other people. And so all, if, if we're speaking, but we're speaking without love, then all we say is ineffective. But then also, without love, all we know is insignificant. Right now, they say that knowledge is doubling every year. Now, for those of you who drive to Atlanta every day, you probably disagree. But there is, more no, there is more technology in our smartphones than there was on the Apollo 11 moon landing. So we, it's, we must be getting smarter, or at least our access to information is growing. But for some reason, even though we're becoming smarter, we're becoming less moral in our society. But without love, all we know is insignificant. In verse 2 it says, I have the, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So without love, all we know is insignificant. But also without love, all we believe is insufficient. All we believe is insufficient. You might say that you believe in Jesus, and that's great, but did you know that even the demons believe in Jesus and they shudder at his name? And so it says in verse 2, and if I have faith that can move mountains, if I have belief, if I believe, if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. But not only that, all we give is incomplete. Without love, all we give is incomplete. Students you gave yesterday, and that was an amazing thing to see you guys with generosity in your hearts go, I want to I give to this. And every week we have, a fen- we have a phenomenal church here, a body of Christ that gives graciously of what they have so that we can continue doing what we're doing so that we can focus in on the mission and continue moving forward but here's the deal no matter what no matter how much we give if we're giving without the idea in mind that love is the motivating force behind that love for God love for others says that if, if, if I give all that I possess to the poor but I have not love so it, 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 with with when we give if we give without love then our giving is in complete and also without love all we accomplish is inadequate without love all we accomplish is inadequate and our society is all about accomplishments right it's all about getting ahead next job next promotion and there's nothing wrong with that but we we, we seem to gauge in our society our ability to have those accomplishments in life And, and so what begins to happen is we begin to measure ourselves by those accomplishments we talked about that this weekend that we begin finding pride in that But without love, all we accomplish uh, is inadequate. In fact, look what it says. If I give over my body, if I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, if if, if, if I give myself to the mission is what Paul is saying, and if I give it over to my, I give my body over to the mission, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So despite what I do, my best efforts to work, if I am doing it without love in my heart for those that don't know Jesus Christ, I'm gaining nothing. And so, so very simply, all of this that we just said, all of these things that without love were insufficient, insufficient, ineffective, all of these things really boil down to a very simple statement that your life minus love equals zero. That you are ineffective in the world around you that is a dark world, that you are not being a light if, if you are trying to do it in a way that is devoid of love. And so I have a question for you. What would your life look like if you chose to love well every day? Today, tomorrow, if you made the decision, you know what? I'm going to love well every day. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move towards this. Man, it would be an amazing movement out of the people of Concord if we stepped out of here going, you know what? I'm going to love well every day. And somebody that I think that we can learn from, we've talked about him this weekend, yes, is Daniel. What, what does it look like to live in such a way where you've got influence in the culture to live, to be a gracious person, but also to be someone who stands for truth? 
that sets you up for God using you in a mighty way. Daniel was one of those guys. In fact, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, it says that it pleased Darius, who is now king at the time, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. At this, now I'm sorry, now Daniel so distinguished himself. Hey students, remember those words just right there. That you would distinguish yourself. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And so at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So finally, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel. He's, like this dude, he ain't perfect, but like he's living in a way that, man, it's really hard for us to say anything about this guy's character. And yes, Daniel is a, man, a great example of what it looks like. But, but even more, like every time we've talked about Daniel and an example that he sets and, and, and what he's and, and what he has done in history and shown us of how to influence a culture around us, we have quickly run to point that there is, there, there is a better Daniel. But, but his name is Jesus. And, and in the Son of God, there is the perfect embodiment of grace and truth. In Jesus, there is the greatest example of what it looks like to love well every day. And so as you walk out of here, I would love for you guys to remember three things. How do you love well every day? Number one, serve them. Tomorrow, this week, next month, whenever it is, ask yourself, who's somebody around me that I need to serve? Who, who, can, I, who, who can I help? Who can I go to in a time of need? Who can I pray over? Who can I say a kind word to? Who just needs someone to come beside them? Who can you serve? 1 Corinthians 9.19, Paul said this, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave, a servant, to everyone to win as many people as possible. Paul knew that in order to lead people to Jesus, Paul knew that in order to bring them to a point where the Lord would begin working on their heart, that it was going to take serving them and loving them. To soften the heart, the outer edges of their heart so that God could then begin pouring in. Paul was like, man, we got we to serve them. And he was just taking an example from Jesus. Because Jesus, you know what he did? He connected before he corrected. Like you see Jesus get up in the face of a bunch of religious people all the time throughout the Gospels. What's interesting is for those that he came to seek and save, he connected before he corrected with them. And I think a great example of this is the story of Zacchaeus. Y'all know that story, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Poor guy. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And so Jesus was entering the town that Zacchaeus was hanging out in. And Zacchaeus must have caught word of it. And so Zacchaeus climbed up in the tree to get a, to get a peek. And as Jesus is going by, he sees Zacchaeus in the tree. He's like, hey, nice fort. Come on down. Not really. He didn't build a fort. But he's like, Zacchaeus, come on down, man. He's like, we're going to your house. And so they went to Zacchaeus' house. We don't have a lot of context about what happened between like right then when they got to the house and later. But what we do know is that Jesus connected with Zacchaeus. And then what's interesting is there must have been something that happened, some conversation. Because at some point, Zacchaeus realizes, I need correction. And so it says that Zacchaeus restored to those that he stole from fourfold. And so Jesus loved well every day. He served people. He connected with them before he corrected them. And then not only did he serve them, but he tells us to set an example for them. That, that we would live in a way that when, when people look at us, hey, students, we respond differently to, the teach, to our teachers in our classrooms than, every, than everybody else does. That, that our dedication in our sport that we play for some reason, has a little bit more drive than someone else. Not because we think we're better than them, but because we're playing for someone else. The way that we manage every other area of life. One of the reasons I think that we become less impactful in the world around us, we talked about it Friday night, is we are unprepared, we are underwhelming, and we are unrecognizable in the world. 
because we're not setting an example for people. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. You are to add the pleasantness, the pleasantness of the presence of Christ through your actions and your lifestyle. And so we serve people, we set an example for them, but then most importantly, we don't need to miss number three. We share Jesus with them. We share the gospel with them. That's the truth that they need. If we miss this, we, we miss the point of what Jesus was trying to do. When we see John chapter 1 where it says that we have seen him and we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only son of the Father, the one who is full of grace and truth, we miss the point. And so we have an opportunity to share Christ with them. In 1 Peter chapter 3 it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But don't miss this part. But do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And so we serve them, we set an example for them, but we most importantly share Christ with them. And at Concord, I love the fact that we want to make sure that we're equipping people with tools to do so. So I want to give you guys a new tool today. And so before you leave, you're going to be handed a little, uh, a little book, a little pamphlet. It's called Life, Three Circles, Life Conversation Guide. You, maybe some of you have heard this before. This is nothing that I created. Somebody else did it, but it's an amazing tool to be able to share the gospel. And it, and it goes like this. The Bible says that God created everything for a, a purpose. That God had a design in mind. And when he created it, he created it good. It was perfect. But here's the problem. Is that God is that, that we sinned. God gave us the choice. You have to have the choice to love something. And so he gave us the choice. And in our choice, we chose not to love him, but we chose to depart from him, to depart from his design, and that's called sin. And the Bible says that all sin, that all fall short of the glory of God. And what we realize from out of our sin, we experience brokenness. Brokenness in our relationship with God, but also brokenness in so many other areas of life. The system is broken. And what's interesting about life is that people in our culture today, in our society, who don't know Jesus, guess what? They are trying to fix their brokenness in so many other ways, but do you know where it leads? Nowhere. And what you find is that people who are in brokenness, they're going to try, they're going to try intellect. They're going to try drugs. They're going to try relationships. They're going to try so many things to fix their brokenness, but guess what? They're going to realize it didn't work, and they're going to be back in the same place that they started. But the good news of the gospel is that even in the midst of our brokenness, Romans chapter 5 verse 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took our brokenness, our sin, our shame on him, on the cross, for our benefit and our good and for his glory. He, was, he died, was buried in a borrowed tomb, three days later was risen from the grave so that he could prove to you and I and everyone else that has ever lived and will ever live that he has the power not only over sin but over death. And the Bible says that if you will just repent and believe in this gospel and this good news, that if you will just turn and confess, turn from your sin and choose to follow Jesus, the Bible says if you will repent and believe that you too will be saved. And the beauty of it is that once you repent and believe that God then puts you on a path where you can recover and pursue God's design for your life. Where you can begin helping others recover and pursue God's design for their life as well. And so when you guys leave, you're going to be handed one of these pamphlets, one of these, uh, one of these books. We would love for you to take it, use it, keep it, give it away. There's an app as well. You can find information of where to get the app on your phone. But to use that as a tool to love well every day. That you would choose to serve them, set an example for them, and share Christ with them. And it's a great tool because, uh, and I know this like uh, from experience, because a couple of months ago I had an opportunity like to jump right into a conversation with someone. And so we were at the house a couple of months ago. It was actually the Sunday afternoon that uh, I got to speak here uh, back in December. We got home, we're eating lunch, and there was a knock on my door. Hold on, back up for a second. I've got to tell you one more thing. 
a couple of years ago, me and my wife, we started praying, Lord, increase our influence. Y'all know what happened? We had eight houses in our neighborhood. A year and a half later, we had like 28 houses in our neighborhood. We were like, okay, we get the picture. Be careful what you pray for. So we're like, Lord, increase our influence. And so he did. He put people in our neighborhood. And so one day, the knock comes on the door a couple of months ago and uh, opened the door, and it's one of my neighbors. And he's like, hey, I need a ride. I'm like, okay. I'm like, where are we going? He's like, I need a ride to the store. Oh, okay, cool. And so we get the keys. I go get in the car, and we head out. We're going for a ride. I was like, well, hey, what, what, you know, what's up? Why do you need a ride? And he's like, well, um, uh, the, my keys are locked in my car, and my wife has the other set of keys, and her and the kids, they left. They're going shopping for the day. So I just, I just need a ride to the store. Oh, okay, cool. Like, we, we're going, you know, we're going to get the keys. You know, we're going, no, I just need to ride to the store. Oh, oh, okay. All right. All right, so we're on the way to the store, and he's like, so what do you do? I'm like, uh, well, I'm a pastor. I work with students, at, uh, and, uh, you know, so, like, love what I get to do. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. So we talk a little bit more about life and just what's going on. And, and uh, we, he, I was like, well, hey, man, where are we going? Like, Walmart? And he's like, no, 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 we just need to go to Chevron. Oh, okay, like, Queens Corner, Chevron, right down the road. All right, cool. So we, on the way, I realize what we're doing. And I realize what we're doing because in the car, uh, I begin to smell the stench of alcohol. And so we're on the way, we get to the Chevron, he gets out, he goes inside, and he comes back with two big old bags full of some more. So we, he hops in, we pull, we're pulling out from the Chevron, and all of a sudden uh, he says, man, I guess I should get back into it. And I, and, you know, I was like, well, what are you talking about? You know, get back, get back into it. Like, it looks like you're getting back into it, bro. But, but I was like, what do you mean, man? He said, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm talking about church. I should probably get back into church, right? He said, because everything seems to go better when you go to church. And so I didn't say anything. And I kept it quiet, and, and, I, and I did it on purpose, because he got a little awkward with it. He's like, don't you think? And I said, mm. I said, man, there's a group of people out there that will tell you that if you follow Jesus, he fixes all of your problems. But I don't think the Bible teaches that. See, what the Bible teaches is that, man, like, you have brokenness in your life. And that, that your, your brokenness you're experiencing is because the sin that's in your life that's keeping you separated from Jesus and following Him. But the Bible says that despite our efforts to break God's design, that you can still be restored out of your brokenness. And that if you'll just repent and believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, you too you, you can experience what a right relationship with God feels like. And then God will begin to help you recover and pursue every area. Or, or he will begin to recover, help you recover and pursue his design for your life in every area. Not that he makes it perfect. Because it's not going to be perfect on this side because we, we, we still got issues. But I said, man, he, he's, got a, he's, got a, he's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your marriage. He's got a plan for your family. He's got a plan for you being a dad. And so God has a design for your life. Students, God has a design for the lives of those that you will come into contact with tomorrow. That design is for you to know Him. But in our sin, we have departed that design. But in God's grace and in His goodness and His mercy towards us, He is offering us, offering you, offering the world an opportunity to come back into restoration with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so that's what this weekend's been all about is that we all want to move to one thing, and that is I stand. That you would stand for truth and love. That leaving out of this room, you would make the commitment that I'm going to stand in a world of darkness, and I'm going to be a light. That you would go from this place realizing that God has called you to something far greater than what culture is offering you. And so all across this room, not just our students, but that we would leave here knowing that God wants to use us in a mighty way to share His good news, to share His gospel, to help people understand that there is a way out of their brokenness and back into restoration with Him. And that's through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to go and do that. And so will you stand? Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You that You allow us to take part in Your mission. Thank You that You have redeemed us, restored us, renewed us. You have brought us out of death and into life. And so even right now, all across this room, Father, all across our other campuses, God, we want to surrender this time to you. We want to come before you and say, Father, 
allow us to submit to you, to get out of the way so, Holy Spirit, you can live out through us so that we will live with boldness and courage, Father. That we would be a light in the dark, that we would be salt of the earth, that we would be unapologetic with the truth, but unrelenting with your grace. And so right now as we respond all across our campuses, Father, help our hearts to tune into you, what you still want to do in this moment. And God, may you be glorified in, in, in these next few moments as we respond to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're here this morning, and uh, you know we just shared the gospel just a second ago, um, and maybe you've never responded, maybe you've never stood, I want to challenge you to do that. I want to challenge you to make your faith public. Now, baptism is, is, is the way to do that. And so if you're here this morning, if you're a student and, and you've given your heart to the Lord, maybe it happened this weekend, maybe it's happened in the past, uh, you, your next step is just to come forward and say, hey, you know what? I need to get baptized. I need to stand and let others know the commitment I've made. But not just our students, but if you're here this morning and that's you, if you know that you need to make that decision in following Christ, we'd love to help you do that. I'm going to be down front, Mason, Pastor Levi, there's a, there'll be several of us that can talk with you. But also if you're here this morning and you want to connect with us at Concord through membership, if you want to partner with us to be a part of the mission of making disciples everywhere, we'd love to talk to you about that. And so uh, we're, I'm going to pray, I'm going to say a word, of pray, I'm gonna say a word and then uh, after, after we pray, I'm going to invite you to stand. And as we stand across the room, we'll be down front, we're going to sing a song of response. And as we sing, we're going to ask that you come forward, make your decision public, whatever it is, so that we can celebrate with you and encourage you and disciple you and move you in the direction that God wants you to go. So all across the room, if you guys would stand, we're going we're gonna to continue in a word of prayer. Father, thank you. The response time is yours, God. We pray that we uh, would stand, that we would stand up in our hearts, but Father, we would also stand in the culture around us, God, for your love, for your life, for your goodness, for your gospel. In your name we pray.